Hello, this is Morgan Freeman, and I want to thank you so much for all the ways that you support my friends on The Edge with Mark Thompson. You know, you can listen on iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, iHeartRadio, and many places that great podcasts are heard. That's an oxymoron, by the way, great podcasts. Or you can go to their website, edge-show.com. Well, still haven't purchased a new domain name, I see. Happy New Year. You're listening to The Edge with Mark Thompson, edge-show.com. Hello and welcome to The Big Show. I just got an email in, which is short, so I can share it with you. It's just one line. It says, uh, could you tell me which of your podcasts you talk about your trip to Vietnam? Which we kind of did a little bit in the last episode, although it was full of mockery and derision, which, frankly, I'm oftentimes deserving of. But if there is more interest in stories from Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia, which really oddly and unexpectedly has become one of my favorite parts of the world, I'd be happy to relate specifics. So if anybody else has an interest in that stuff, I can devote a segment or some time on the show to that. Anyway, if you do, drop us an email at edgewithmarkthompson at gmail.com. On today's show, three conversations. Michael Shore kicks us off with political talk from the road, literally. He will call in, and he has some reflections on everything from shutting down the government to what's happening in this increasingly broad and inclusive presidential election. Then we talk to Brooke Thomas, whose work on the TYT Network you might be familiar with as a political commentator. But she's been on the Steve Harvey show, and she's done a bunch of stuff, and she's got an interesting background. And that conversation, she just stopped through for like a quick conversation. I think it's about 20 minutes or so. And then a super scientist. I've always wanted to get a super scientist on the show, and we have one in this episode. He is an oceanographer. He's an expert in sea ice. He's an expert in permafrost. And he's calling us from Alaska, where he's a research scientist, a super scientist on today's show. Thanks for all the ways you support our show. Five-star reviews, sharing our show, telling people about an episode, sending them a link to the episode. Those are all ways you help grow this community, and I appreciate it. If you want to financially help us, yes, you can send us a donation through PayPal, which is on our website, edge-show.com. There's a little PayPal link. Or if you're going to shop Amazon, and I'm not telling you to shop Amazon. Maybe you're not about Amazon, which is fine. But if you're going to, please do it through our website, edge-show.com. Click on any episode and you'll see an Amazon link. It'll say shop Amazon or just click on anywhere it says Amazon and you will go to Amazon, same Amazon as usual, but we get a little piece of whatever you spend. That's how we help to sustain this podcast. Every dollar stays with this podcast. That's it. That's all. Enjoy. Thanks for being here. Let's get started. <laughs> This is the edge. The advantage, it means. Hey, look, I just spit on me for no reason. That's horrible. Is there some comfort in uncertainty, do you think? You're a degenerate. Because Australian shepherds need action. Wow. Yeah. This is the edge. That's a self-loathing term that I use. For. Oh, got it. Michael Shore joins us by phone. Where are you, Michael Shore? Well, Mark, I don't need to tell you where I am. If I tell you that I'm on the way from Tallahassee to Dothan, Alabama, you'll come right back and say, oh, you must be near Cottondale. And in fact, I'm near Cottondale. <laughs> what is uh, near Cottondale? There's not much near Cottondale. Tallahassee an hour back and Dothan an hour ahead, I think. Or that's all that's near Cottondale. But here's what's not near Cottondale. Any place to buy coffee. You're having trouble finding coffee, that's it? We are having trouble finding coffee on the road. What, what is the story that you're there the covering, edge. though? We're covering the story. It's an interesting story. It's, there's a man in Dothan, Alabama, who grew up there. He's a Jewish man and who sees his faith disappearing in this part of the country. And he's been a successful businessman, and he's trying to pay Jewish families, Jewish people, Jewish couples, to move to Dothan, Alabama to reinvigorate the Jewish population here. He loves the city. He thinks it's a great place, but he's afraid that uh, all Jewish identity will be lost in the South, particularly where he lives. And the people that have done it, some of, are happy and some are not. And we're going to go talk and find out about this story and, and what it does. What an interesting idea and what an interesting story. Yeah. Hear more yeah, about it's that. Sociologically, that. Yeah. So I'll make sure the Edge audience hears about it. Yeah, for sure. So, Michael, the government remains closed down. 
And I just wanted to, you know, you're so tuned in to political wins, and yet I feel as though this moment in time transcends politics, because I most recently saw that Mitch McConnell had gone to the Oval Office to prevail upon Trump to get off of this government shutdown thing. The polls all are pointing to the fact that people associate this shutdown with Trump and the GOP. There wouldn't seem to be a political arithmetic that leads people in the GOP to back the president in this regard. So I guess what I'm getting at is it seems to kind of somehow be unprecedented in traditional politics anyway. Well, it is. I mean, it is and it isn't. I mean, this is politics. This is what these people do for a living. And the politics of this are that Republicans, when they go to voters and when they are, you know, the people that they are in this Congress don't want to give up on funding the wall. The president certainly doesn't want to. And as we head into an election next year, it really, as you know, begins this year. You have people announcing left and right they're running. So you understand why there's an impasse. But the Democrats, which is unusual, don't have any reason to compromise here. They've just been sent to Washington and with a nice majority for them. And there's nothing that motivates them to compromise here because the polls are showing that they are not being blamed for this shutdown. And they may be the beneficiaries of the bad policies that the president, in the eyes of Americans, is sort of pushing forward here. So it's fascinating. And Americans themselves don't come into contact with a government shutdown in the first few weeks generally. It's not noticed as much. But as it wears on, People are going to be encountering difficulties because of this shutdown. And when that happens, when the general public is affected by it is when you'll probably see some sort of change. I was just talking to my colleagues before we started this conversation, and I really feel that if the TSA walked off the job the next day, maybe even the next hour, the shutdown would be over because that would affect so many people, not just humans traveling to places they need to get to. No, but but businesses. businesses as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You make a great point. And in pockets around the country, TSA is not showing up to the point that it's affecting air travel. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's true. It didn't affect me today in my anecdotal, uh, my first dip into this since the shutdown, but or second anyway. So the two times that I've traveled, it hasn't. But I, I do think that, you know, if it's done en masse and, and you see TSA workers fed up with having to do this. And there's the risk of being blamed, too. If something were to happen, you're understaffed, if you're lack, a lackadaisical because you're overtired and overworked. And they don't want to be a part of that risk. They don't want to be blamed should something, you know, God forbid, happen. Yeah. You mentioned that all these people are running for president now on the Democratic side. All these people are either sniffing around or formally declaring that they are forming presidential committees, this sort of thing. Yeah. What's the state of the state? Who do you take seriously? Yeah, at the beginning, you have to take everybody seriously. There are going to be people that you won't hear from again. And then there'll be people among this crowd who are going to surprise you somewhere. And then there's going to be someone who does really well early who was forgotten late. And it's just sort of how it always happens. But the interesting takeaways for me thus far, and I think there's more to come, but I think Elizabeth Warren's candidacy and the candidacy of Tulsi Gabbard, of uh, the Democrat from Hawaii, is interesting as to what it does. It gives the real sort of farther left progressives a choice that they didn't have last time. Last time it was all about Bernie Sanders. So when and if Bernie Sanders joins the race, it's going to be tougher for him to get as big a piece of pie as he did last time because there are other options for progressives. And if Senator Sherrod Brown joined, he too will probably take a little bit of that out of the Bernie camp. And I think that that, you know, I think the Bernie supporters are trying to deride people like Warren, trying to deride, as you've seen from the very get-go, Beto O'Rourke, who they were fearful would step in and do that, may still do that. And that's going to set up an interesting dynamic. And then there are some senators, there are a number of women who are going to be running. And then there are people that you haven't even heard of. The governor of Montana, former governor Steve Bullock. I think he's going to run for president. He's going to be the new flavor. He's going to get his moment in the sun. And he may turn some people on. So it's so early, but it's it's interesting to see what people are starting to do because you have to join early to staff up early and to get the right, you know, the right staff in places that are important. And there are new places that are important now too, like California, like Nevada, who have moved their primaries up earlier. Nevada is soon after the New Hampshire primary. So setting up for an interesting field. You know, we'll talk about this when you get back a little bit more, but I, and we kind of hinted at it from time to time. You know, I always am telling you that I don't like anything the way anything's set up, and they should just overhaul the way we do things, both in government and in the election process, certainly. One of yeah. the things, though, just apropos of what you just mentioned, I don't understand why the election season proceeds 
reads as it does on the calendar, putting so much emphasis, again, in places that I don't feel should get the kind of amplification of their vote the way they do. Iowa, for yeah, example. Well, well, one of the things that you know when you cover this stuff and you're in Iowa and you're in New Hampshire is the demographics of it would indicate that these should not be the first places that have it, which is why South Carolina moving to the sort of top of the order was such an important change because it brought in African Americans in a way that you don't see any, and I shouldn't say none, but you see very few in Iowa and New Hampshire. On the other side of the coin is there are very few places that have such a universal level of political acuity that New Hampshire and Iowa have because of it. So you see voters who are really informed, who are really passionate, and you also have an opportunity because of the smaller populations for these candidates to do so much retail politicking. So there is a little bit of a balance to it, and it isn't going to change in the near future, um, but, uh, but there are certainly reasons to criticize it. But as other states move up sooner, I think it makes it more important. So there'll be different strategies. A lot of people are going to go to California earlier than they ever had because it's so voter rich. But you're not going to be able to get the the same intimacy that you would in Iowa or New Hampshire as a candidate. And that's where you get momentum. You get momentum in the early states. Let's go to the confirmation hearing quickly of this Bill Barr, William Barr. You know, he's going through the process of being confirmed as attorney general for Donald Trump. This is all while Donald Trump is declaring war on, it would seem, uh, the Justice Department, the FBI, Robert Mueller. I mean, there are a lot of things that's just odd that are coming out of the Justice Department that Donald Trump has declared sort of a jihad against. How does this guy fit into that narrative? And also, who is this guy? (laughs) Well, he was George Bush's uh, attorney general. Uh, He was a U.S. attorney. He's a guy, I mean, there are some odd blemishes on his record. One, to me, the most is that when George Allen, the uh, former senator of Virginia and former governor of Virginia, and a really de- divisive, a racially divisive guy who lost a very close race on a racial, you know, I guess, epithet. Uh, he called someone Makaka, which is a monkey name. It was a strange, it was a strange turn of events that changed his campaign. But he was the governor of Virginia, appointed William Barr to a commission. The commission was put in place because they wanted to abolish parole in the state of Virginia. So his idea of justice was very, very conservative, and it continued that way. When he was the the U.S. attorney, when he was the U.S. attorney general under George H.W. Bush, um, he's somebody who came in and pardoned some of the Iran-Contra figures, particularly his close relationship with Casper Weinberger, the former Secretary of Defense, led him to do that. He's a guy who has just been really conservative for a really long time. That said, he's also somebody who has been mainstream conservative. You don't think of a George H.W. Bush Republican in the same way as you would if there's such a thing as a Donald Trump Republican. So there is a bit of a divide there. But his respect for the Justice Department, you think, would be a pretty important part of his makeup and the wake of hearing that the Justice Department investigated Donald Trump's relationship with Russia. You wonder how Barr is going to balance that. He's also saying, and he said in the hearing, that he doesn't even know if the findings of the Mueller investigation would be made public, that they may remain private, which seems unlikely, but I guess possible. You mentioned the Iran-Contra scandal, and it was it was a big deal. We call it the Iran-Contra scandal, and it's that's sort of a shorthand for arms for hostages, but there was money laundering. And there was uh, terrorism and there were drugs involved. I mean, it was really quite a, uh, a witch's brew of bad stuff. And so when you talk about a pardon, I mean, it was a pardon for a lot of people who were involved in some pretty nasty stuff. Not so different than what's going on now. I mean, you know, there were a, a lot of officials around, as you say, the president of the United States, and they were being indicted and they might have actually seen jail time. Yeah, that's right. Casper Weinberger, particularly. Casper Weinberger went, he hadn't even gone to trial when his pardon came down, if I remember correctly. So, listen, when pardons happen, by definition, pardoning people who did bad things, right? And so the pardon system seems really flawed to me and that you would do it. But in occasion, on occasion, there are people who seem deserving of it. And, and these political pardons, whether it be Scooter Libby pardoned by George W. Bush or Casper Weinberger and some of the others in Iran-Contra, It just happens, and it's unfortunate. But these are people that really, in a way, it was cowboy diplomacy going against the laws of the United States, things that Congress didn't approve, going around the backs of Congress to support a group 
in Latin America who they felt was right, and they sold arms to help those people. It was really a messy thing. So that pardon didn't seem to save anything. Pardoning Richard Nixon even could be argued that it was time for the country to move on, and it was a bold uh, thing for the for Ford to do because he knew he would never win re-election, whether you agree with it or not. But this, there was nothing bold about it. It was purely political and it was purely cronyism. And if that's the kind of politics that William Barr plays, then certainly you can learn from that. You wonder how he's going to be with Donald Trump. What about Steve King, Michael? I mean, what is his future as a legislator? There's a move to censure him. I, I don't know that that's going to happen. The Republicans have stripped him of all his committee assignments, which is about as bad a position you can be in as a congressman because you have zero effect other than to vote on bills when you're not on a committee. And he has great company. Duncan Hunter, who's indicted, the Republican from California, has no committee assignments, nor does Chris Collins, also indicted, the Republican from New York State. Steve King is a Republican, a conservative Republican from Iowa, who has a history of talking up the white race, engaging people who are either virulent nationalists or toe the line of what is considered racism. And, you know, he's the guy that invited Geert Wilders. Geert Wilders is an anti-Muslim Dutch man who was a politician in the Netherlands, invited him to Congress. He's dabbled in the Austrian election trying to help elect a far-right uh, candidate there. In the Toronto's mayor race, he opined that someone who was anti-Muslim would be a good candidate there. A congressman from Iowa has no business chiming in on the Iowa race, especially to a candidate as divisive as the woman he was supporting. Now people are starting to take offense because he gave an interview to the New York Times. A lot of people have taken offense for a long time. For some reason, this interview got a lot more publicity where he defended nationalism, really, and said that he's a defender of Western civilization. And these are all dog whistles for what racism is and what, you know, and so when you hear nationalism, you hear Nazism. Anyway, the Des Moines Register, the paper of record in Iowa, has said that they think he should resign. The future does not look bright in Congress for Steve King. you, you got to keep your racism a little bit lower profile, but that's the moral of right. the story. Yeah, because, exactly. The, the thing is, if you're a racist, just don't talk about it. Right. I mean, you know, please direct your attention and your energies toward voter suppression or something that will really keep people of color down. You know, Keep they, the mask uh, on. Right. right exactly. Right. Keep the mask on. Michael Verna Bloom died, and I will just tell everyone who might not recognize the name Verna Bloom that she was the actress who played the dean's wife, Mrs. Warmer, in Animal and House. In Animal House. Yeah, yeah, we had one of the most memorable scenes uh, with Tim Matheson and a cucumber at a grocery store. And uh, she was the... Uh, the wife of the dean and Tim Matheson's character said that my name is Eric, but they call me Otter. And she said, my name is so-and-so, but they call me Mrs. Wormer. And he said, oh, that's such a coincidence. We have a Dean Wormer. And she said, that's such a coincidence. I have a husband named Dean Wormer. <laughs> he was, and he had been flirting with her over a cucumber and, you know, opened with minds bigger. Anyway, it was a huge loss to show business. And since I don't know anybody in the movies and there was somebody who, who did we talk about last week? I don't remember who they are. But, oh, the Jonas Brothers. That's right. right. We talked about the Jonas yeah. Brothers. We uh, talked about the Jonas yeah. Brothers, but not that they, not that they. No, that no one had died in the case of the Jonas Brothers, but we did touch right. on them last week. Yeah. But now everybody knows Verna Bloom, and I'm glad for it. And in a decidedly less humorous role, she played Jesus's mother in The Last Temptation of Christ. That's right. We yeah. call her Mary. <laughs> <laughs> she was 80 years old, and she died yeah. in Bar Harbor, Maine. Uh, Verna Bloom. All right. We want to see you back here soon. Are you coming back next week? Will we have you in studio or what? We, we should have me in studio next week, yeah. All right. We consider this, again, just on the pile of great sacrifices you make for the show. This is yet another one. Thank you for taking a moment and calling in. <laughs> Always my pleasure. Bye, Michael. Bye, Mark. Get more of The Edge on Stitcher and iTunes or go to our website, edge-show.com. Please welcome to the microphones, Brooke Thomas. Yes! <laughs> yes! The crowd loves Brooke Thomas. <laughs> we like to bring our guests on with some canned applause. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't canned. No, but it's augmented later in post with canned okay. applause. <laughs> now, Brooke, you're a journalist, you're a show host, you're a political commentator, you are a Regularly seen on the Young Turks Network mm -hmm. and Kardashian fan. It's, you know, I'm a well rounded individual. <laughs> 
you're uh, you're on an interesting show because this show that you're on to this episode is made up of a couple of different conversations one of which is with a super scientist uh-huh. he's a he's an oceanographer an expert in climate change and climate science and sea ice and all this stuff and I'm worried that it's going to be a little too technical for the audience but I wanted the audience to hear from a real scientist you know yeah. and so because I'm kind of asking you, you think, I guess people can just, if they, they can hang with it and probably be able to, to get it. I think we should try. Yeah. I think that's, that's where it, maybe you can't, you don't feel like you can hang with it, but you should try. Most of what you know? we do in this episode with this conversation with the guests, first only about 20 minute conversation, but whatever defining of terms or basic understanding we try to lay out, it all leads to conclusions that are important. So that's kind of what the reason, it's not like a science class, but I'm just worried that people at a moment or two might think, oh, this is like a science class, but I'm hoping it, I'm gotta, hoping people stay with it. We kind of need a science class. And it's so much that we never realized we needed to know so much about going on right now. You know I, what I mean? Right. Thank that, you. That's... That our future depends on it. And I, last year, two No, not last year, but five years ago, I didn't think so. I didn't think it would be so much a part of my job Yeah. until, you know. Thank you for saying that, because I think that's exactly why we're doing it, because Mm -hmm. it is so very important. And it's so confusing, and so, but you you need to know. And I think a lot of us would like to get it more. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to, with confidence... move ahead. Brooke Thomas, you live in Los Angeles now. I do. Thank goodness. Ah. You're not from LA. No, I'm an Okie from Muskogee. I'm from from Muskogee, Oklahoma. Oklahoma. For real? Uh Uh-huh. There are about 10 black people out there. I (laughs) was one. Now nine. Right. Eight of them are my family. No, there (laughs) there are a lot of us out there. But yeah, I'm from Oklahoma. I'm from small town, Oklahoma. It's outside of Tulsa. When you say that, when you kind of reference it in a laugh, did you feel as a kid like, wow, I'm one of the few black faces in this school or in this shop? Or Oh, for sure. Oh, my goodness. We I took um like honors courses during overachiever here in uh, middle school. Thank you. But I know. And there were always just me and this kid, Ishmael, just the two of us. And we rode the same bus to school together. So we sit at the bus stop in the morning. So I knew him very well. But in all the honors classes, it was just me and Ishmael. Maybe there were 30 kids in the classes. So it's like you notice it because you can count each other. You know, there were more in my school. You know, my second job, my first job in TV was in North Dakota. So, you know, it it was even worse. Uh But in Lubbock, this was my second job in TV. There were four high schools. And one day, and three of them are like predominantly white. They looked like Oklahoma. But one of them is on the east side of town, and it is a predominantly black school, which is something I had never experienced before growing up, ever. And (laughs) I remember it was, I, I don't know, maybe around... I don't know. I don't know what time it was. It was early. It was in the morning, but we're in the hallway doing just some general story there. And me and my photographer and the bell rang. And so all these kids start rushing out of the classrooms and I'm looking around. I don't see one white kid. And I thought, what? Like, you, you know what I mean? That's, it was just so the different. The black from people what, are fleeing. Right. I, it just was like, what is this school? It's I happened. couldn't imagine what that was like. And to see so many people who look like you that aren't your family members, that's, I don't know, that was cool. Yeah. You know, when you grow up in sort of a liberal house and uh-huh. during the civil rights movement, which is, you know, kind of what my experience was, my mom marched with Martin Luther King and all that stuff, I never really focused or understood maybe the importance of not being the only black face or oh the only goodness, black yeah. person. Because when I say black face, of course, I'm talking about there's a the black experience that you've brought with that life and that face, yeah. right? So I have to sort of shamefully almost admit that I thought, well, what's the big deal? I mean, we don't care about race here. Yeah, dude, but your experience as a white guy is way different. And so it's good for me to be around others who've had my experience in addition to an integrated situation with white people as well. Right. I'm, I'm sort of not making myself clear. No, you but... are. You're, you're com- making yourself completely clear, I think, especially if you live, um, you know, as, you know, an ally to, you know, black Americans and, you know, you do things right and, and you aren't you know you don't have you know many prejudices that are that are intentional and things like that I think there's still so much that you can miss a good example is when President Obama was elected a lot of you know really good people who who you know didn't have you know racist issues at all like in their circle within them within their family were like wow this country's so divided all of a sudden and then all their black friends are like what where have you been it's not all of a sudden (laughs) Right. But it's just because, you know, there's a lot that you can miss if you don't live those experiences, even if you try to help people who don't look like you. I had no idea. Yeah. We've seen these divisions now, as you say, come to the surface. They yeah. are no longer suppressed. There may be others that are suppressed, but in any way, we've seen 
a tremendous divide come to the surface now. And it's race, religion, it's tribalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you move out here, uh-huh. welcome to a lot more black faces and a lot more. But you were in North Dakota. Lubbock. Lubbock. And then Memphis, though, which was like, whoa. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's. I mean, that's... that was an experience. It's probably you know I love living in Los Angeles. If I take out LA, the best part of my career ever. Those two years I was in Memphis. Did you go to uh, Graceland? How about I? The whole time I was there, I never once went to Graceland. That is terrible. Well, that's because you're black. <laughs> no, <laughs> probably no. If you it's were a white so kid. Terrible. No, I, it's I because didn't... of your age. Do you yeah. understand the demographic? But everyone Elvis, Elvis fan, was right? this. I'm not, just not. My family. Well, you know, Elvis yeah. celebrated. Look, I don't know a lot about. Uh, now I'll get a bunch of emails. I'll get a bunch of emails. From, it's fine. It's no, fine. Right. celebrated <laughs> black music by essentially aping it. And, right. You know what I mean? He all he did he was borrowed do, it. He did. He stole a bunch of <laughs> yes. black stuff. Everything from black moves to black songs that he then. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I mean, it's more palatable coming from him. So no, and it, he, it was yeah, a he, massive success. It was like he was the a little bit James Brown, and yeah. but as I say, somebody can send me an email and tell me I'm full of shit. But this is essentially, I saw Elvis as a great entertainer, but I, I'm not an Elvis scholar, so I don't know. I do think that there was still, there's still, you know, no real excuse for me not to go to Graceland. No excuse at all. There's still so much history and such a cool experience, and I just never did it. I went to the National Civil Rights Museum like eight times. There's no reason that I shouldn't have gone. To Grace and I probably had barbecue 10 times a week. You know what I mean? I was busy eating, pulled pork and stuff. Just... I went to aye, aye, Memphis aye. once and I would think I've told this story on the air maybe a while ago, but so I'll quickly, I'll make it short, but I went for a a show on Fox. I was doing a show called Encounters. Okay. Now, Encounters was a show about supernatural stuff that happened. So there were stories of UFOs and ghost stories and that kind of thing. And they sent me to Memphis for a story about a house that was not on the Graceland property, but it's just a, a like catty corner to Graceland. It's where Elvis put up his best friend, Gary something, I forget what his last name was. Okay. And supposedly now the house is haunted with the ghost of Elvis Presley. Oh, Elvis is still there. Okay. <laughs> so all they right, sent uh-huh. me down. <laughs> and all I'm thinking... Because I'm like, I don't even want to go particularly, but I've never been to Graceland. I want to go see Graceland. Yeah. So they send me down there, but it's a quick day trip. So I fly from L.A. to, so I've got to. That's a long flight, though. i got to make short work of it, too. It's like, hey, I did overnight there, but I mean, I'm just going to be out the next morning. Mm-hmm. So I get down there before Graceland opens, and the shoot's at like, I forget what time, but the store that's across the street from Graceland, there's like an Elvis memorabilia store. I go in there, and I remember I bought like a dozen of those Elvis clocks, which used to be the coolest thing. (laughs) So it's Elvis with his upper part of his body kind of frozen, but the bottom part, his legs and his (laughs) hips, they go swing back and forth to keep time, right? So it's really kind of funny and good, and so I get 12 of those, and then I bought a couple of other Elvis things, and then I had to go to the shoot i couldn't you see couldn't graceland they... open oh, no. so i go okay so everything for the shoot like about how this house is haunted there's all this stuff that goes on and we should, supposedly the radio station that she had always changed to an elvis song every night or and this they had she had a sliding door that had kind of cracked in, in this intense cracking like a lot of mini cracks inside the major crack and if you looked it kind of did look like elvis with his cape on <laughs> Can't. All right. Yeah, yeah, okay, exactly. But it was like a Rorschach test. So anyway, we're doing all this thing, and all I'm looking at my watch every two seconds. you want to get going, back there. I want to go to Graceland, right, right, right. right. But you're talking to her, and then they're shooting the B-roll and all this crap. And at the end, we're in the bathroom because she claimed that she would go to bed. It was a single woman living there, and the toilet seat was down. And when she'd get up in the morning to go in the bathroom, the toilet seat was up. And she claimed that that was the ghost of Elvis moving the toilet seat up. Yeah, it's totally... I mean, it, I, I don't, it's a sign to move... <laughs> if anything, you know, I don't know who's there. Something's going but, on. Right. But it may not uh-huh. be Elvis, but something's going on. <laughs> but it's on. time to go. Right. So, um, so we're reenacting this with a lipstick can, the, the toilet seat going <laughs> up, and it's totally ridiculous, right? And all I'm doing is looking at my watch going, and this shoot, shoot's gone on for 11 hours, and we, and, and Graceland is closed, and yeah. I never did you get never to Graceland. To yeah. But it's a cool view from the front. Yes, you're right. See that. In fact, some would say that that's the best way to see it, because mm-hmm. it looks like time has stopped in 1970 closed. or something there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, but Memphis, I mean, really was the seat of so much of the black experience in the South, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's where Dr. King was killed. Right. 
Yeah, right there. And uh, they've also, there's so, so, so many uh, things that are just preserved. That hotel, the balcony. Sure. Graceland, yeah. So how long were you in Memphis? Two years. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. How did your views change maybe as a result of living in some of these places? Like, in a way, your experience is really a cool one, right? Yeah. Oklahoma, North Dakota, yeah. Memphis. I mean, these are, you know, North wildly... Dakota was not a cool experience. It was a cold experience. Right. Okay? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, North Dakota, the weather is so unforgiving. It was so cold. How long were you there? <laughs> it seemed like an eternity, I'm sure. Three months. Wow, you really wanted out. I was in and out of there, but I wasn't under contract there, and then I got another job in Lubbock, and I just was so happy to go back <laughs> towards home, you know? I just drove till I started to thaw out. So you end up in L.A., mm -hmm. and... Through Dallas and Philly, now wow, in L.A. you really, you know... All. You know the business, though. It is true yeah. that you need to keep moving market to market if you want to advance your career, and you look at different opportunities that the market might offer you. Here in Los Angeles, you can do things other than just be on the on the air as a news person. Exactly. Possibly. So here in L.A., you chose to move to a place kind of special, right? You live yeah, where? I mean, it's incredibly special. Oh, oh, the place, I think L.A. is just magical. But I live in Ladera Heights. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, but tell, but L Ladera Heights is near Inglewood. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, so all of those little cities, neighborhoods over there, like Windsor Hills, View Park, Baldwin Hills, Ladera Heights, Inglewood, I think it's it's a bunch of... Super successful Los Angeles black people. I don't know. And I think it's a cool area to be in. It's something that I've never kind of experienced. My mom lives in Atlanta now, which is, you know, so obviously tons of successful black people in Atlanta forever. Sure. But there's just something about um, these are black people who are also Californians. Right. who also do California things and have Los Angeles jobs. Am I making any sense? Yeah, you're, in fact, you're making so much cool sense. it's a thing to be around. It's, it's interesting to me because I don't think that way. Mm -hmm. And it's always, but in a way, we all do think that way. For mm -hmm. example, we decide what schools are the best schools for our kids or what kids we want our kids to be around. Sort of what streams we want to swim in. And those streams around our neighborhood are the streams we're going to be swimming in most frequently. And there's just extra things when you think about even like what school so you want to find you know you, you want your kid to find a good school where they can be you know educated really well where the teachers really care you also as like a black person you need to find a school where teachers are sensitive to that and knowledgeable about that and maybe where your kids will face less microaggressions and then also where they can see successful black people and so you know what I mean you know you don't even think that you can do it maybe sometimes until you see it so there's, there's what do you mean by what do you piece. mean by that you don't think that you can do it um I wonder if like the rate of young black kids who dream of being president went up after they finally saw one it I starts see. to become realistic so and you think about that um when it comes to being the mayor of a city or being a principal of a school or being, you know what I mean, being a doctor, or being a surgeon, that's things a, like that. Yeah. That's great. Being I a mean, news anchor, things uh, like that. Yeah. yeah, you're saying that, uh, or I think you're saying that your experience is informed a bit by what you see around you. So you see successful black people, you see successful people of color. And you realize, oh, as a person of color, that success is not walled off to me. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And, and that seems weird if you have never experienced not seeing that. Right. You know what I mean? Right. When you live in some of those places that you mentioned. It's just you, all over. Yeah. I don't know. And it's just, it's cool to be around. It's cool to be at Starbucks where it's a bunch of, you know, young black kids who are super artsy in there. I don't know. It's just, it's cool to be around. Anyway, back to your life. You're out in L.A., and I saw you with Steve Harvey. Was that yeah. a, What's the story on with Steve Harvey? I, he does this thing on this show called Straight Talk, and he basically brings on like, TV personalities. He brings on a panel of women, and they talk about women's issues. And I think it's fun because it's his talk show, but, you know, he can't. He wants to, you know, talk about those things for his audience, but he can't do it alone. Sure. So he brings on a panel of women and lets us chat about things that we care about. And so it's pretty cool. So what kind of things do you care about? We talked about, I mean, I t you know, I care about a lot of stuff. But we talked about <laughs> dating hey, and Steve, things like I that. Steve, I care I about a bunch. I don't know what right. these, the other what, two. No, we're I'm talking just about saying, but I care about a lot of stuff. You don't need the other two girls. <laughs> no, um, but it was cool. I was there with Cheryl Burke and uh -huh. Bridget Kelly. Bridget's the singer. Cheryl Burke was on Dancing with the Stars. Sure. And she took over for Dance Moms when, um, it was just a TV show on <laughs> Lifetime, when the main dance teacher went to federal prison. Yeah, that's a... That's a tough break. It's a tough break. But, but a great so break for Cheryl I was Cheryl a Burke. fan. Yeah, yeah, I like her.
So, so, uh, cool. so what kind of stuff did you talk about? We talked about dating. Uh-huh. Dating and public apologies. That was kind of the topic of the day. Is Cheryl Burke single also? No, she is engaged to her ex-boyfriend from 10 years ago. She told us the story. It was a really cute story. but she did. And I ended up like finding her on Instagram afterwards, just wanted to follow her page. And it turns out her fiancé, who she was talking about the whole time, is Matthew Lawrence. Like the actor, Joey Lawrence's brother. Oh. Yeah. So they, I was like, so that's they cool. used to date and uh Then she said that her family's always liked him and one Christmas they were like, Oh, whatever happened to him or something like that. I'm probably getting the story wrong. But her uh-huh. sister texted him and he wrote back and they end up going to lunch and now they're engaged a couple years later. Matthew Lawrence from Boy Meets World. His brother Joey was on Blossom. Right. And Matthew was they did this show together called Brotherly Love, I think. Brotherly Love, that's yeah, Matthew Lawrence, uh-huh. right. That's wild. I know, so, and so I was so like, So they oh, dated no. and, and then reconnected. And they were single, they were separate for 10 years. Is there anybody who you dated who you would like reconnect with uh-uh. now? I don't remember them. Really? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Once they're gone, they're gone. I'm sorry, who? No, uh-uh, no. So you don't pine for anybody? Mm-mm. You don't, you don't keep a candle in like the window Like Michael for B. Anyone. Jordan. I <laughs> No, I'm talking about people <laughs> that with, I actually with whom know. you've been involved. No, I don't. No. Uh-uh. Uh-huh. Wish him well. I... <laughs> <laughs> is that a priority or is more a priority like your life and career and that if that happens, it just happens? No, I think everything's equal. Mm-hmm. You know, my um, career is a priority because, I mean, I have to pay my rent. Right. And so it's lucky that I like what I do. Your family's all in Oklahoma still? Oh, no, you no. said your mom's in Atlanta, right? Yeah, my mom's in Atlanta. Um, I was actually raised by my grandparents. They are much older. They were. They both passed away, but much older than your average grandparent growing up. My grandpa, his name um, was E.W. Thomas. Uh-huh. E period, W period. It stands for nothing. I don't know where his mom got that from. It's a great It's, it's a, a great, great name, yeah, right? It really E.W. Works. And he had like this really great like reddish brown skin, so everyone called him red. Uh-huh. Um, and he was born in 1918. And wow. my grandma, Lula, Lula Pearl, they are so Oklahoma. E.W. and Lula. E.W. Wow. <laughs> and do, um, how do they talk? They talk like that, like Oklahoma? No, they don't. <laughs> I think, because I don't sound like I'm from no, Oklahoma. No, but I? you know, you could lose you know? that. If, I'm just I, wondering but, if so you they, can put it on. I feel like on. they kind of talk like me. Okay. Just slow and very soft. Mm-hmm. But my grandma was born in 1921. And so those were the people who raised wow. me. Yeah, they had 11 children. They had 11 children. They had 11 children, and then my mom is the youngest of 11. Now, what happened to your mom that you ended up being raised by your grandparents? Yes, so, and my mom and I, we have a great relationship. We're super close. She was young when she had me. She had me when she was in college, and the story gets confusing, but I think my grandparents just kind of took over. I see. She was, you know, their youngest kid, and they feel like, oh, no, like, we're still taking care of you. And so I got sick, a normal sick, I think, um... But my grandparents drove three hours in the snow and were like, okay, we're taking this baby home. And I think she just couldn't win the fight. I see. And But then, so I moved back in with my mom when she graduated. And uh, she actually got, so we were living in Tulsa together. And she actually got a job in um, Hartford, Connecticut. And that would mean, you know, I'm going to be, you know, in, in daycare all day. And it just didn't make any sense. So then I moved back to Muskogee and with my grandparents so that I could start school and be with them every day. And so how old were you then then, at that point? Four. Uh Uh-huh. And then, so my mom moved to Hartford and I would spend summer breaks, Christmas break, spring break, a couple weekends a year, things like that with my mom. Phone on the day, you know, every day. But I lived with my grandparents. But you had all these cousins in this family. I mean, I think there are 70 of us when it comes to cousins. Wow. Like, I have a couple cousins, a few cousins out here. My Aunt Joanne, she's the second oldest child. She moved out here when she was 18. Of course, my mom wasn't even born yet. And her kids are older than my mom. Her grandkids are about my age. Wow. And so I'm pretty close with a couple of them. And then some of them, though, have kids. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. That's unreal. That's so, so there's a lot of us who are grandkids, great-grandkids, great-great-grandkids. Things like that. With that big a crew, uh-huh. do you know who everybody is? I do. And I actually got really lucky because when you think of it, I lived at the main house. So everyone knows me because everyone knows their grandma or their great grandma or their mom. And so everyone's close with me because when you come and visit your mom or your grandma, Brooke's there. Oh, that's so. Really and cool. it's funny because I have siblings. I have two little sisters and a little brother. And... The oldest of my little siblings, Haley, she's 10 years exactly younger than me. 
and they grew up in the Northeast. They grew up in Massachusetts. My mom ended up meeting my stepdad. They moved from to Massachusetts. And there was a funeral. It was my grandma's funeral, actually. And so we're all back in Oklahoma. And I'm having to explain, like, you know, through whispers to my little sisters who just came and hugged them. Wow. You know? Oh, no, that's your cousin. That's uncle. That's, you know, that's his daughter. Yeah, because your universe of who you know, even within mm-hmm. your family, is sort of defined by who you interact with. Yeah. So somebody comes forward and says, oh, I'm Robert. You know, I, I have I an Uncle Robert. That. He's and great. Then, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you have every name covered. I have every name. So there's a, there are a lot of us, but I'm really, really close with my family. You know, it, they say it takes a village, but I had a, what's bigger than a village? <laughs> <laughs> a city. <laughs> right. I mean, that really does, I think, help. You know, I a kid so. feels like they belong. A kid feels supported. I mean, there was a fork in the road. If you'd ended up with your mom when you were four years old, you would have had a very different life. A totally different life. You know, I think my mom would have been happier. I'm sure she had, like, such, like, super lonely moments. Like, you miss your kid. But I don't think I'd be doing what I do today. I don't know. I don't think I would be as confident, not because my mom would lack in anything, but I literally grew up with 50 people every day, you know, saying you're great and you're this and you're that. And just, you know, anything bad someone can say to you, I have 50 people who have already told me otherwise. How do they you know? how do they wrangle those numbers for meals or for activities or uh, I mean like what I understand everybody's at different ages uh-huh. so that some are checking and out. And everyone has their own families and so right. like you know my uncle Robert he's got kids and No, but I'm kids. talking about when you grew up. Growing up with that many people in the equation, you don't sit down for dinner no, with that no, many people. No, there was people. no weekly dinner, but there was Christmas Eve celebration every year. And it's funny the way they did it was everyone who was at the Christmas Eve celebration the the, the year before, my grandma had this little like ceramic um apple thing I don't know it was this giant fake apple and it opened up at the bottom and so she would write everyone's name who was there and just people coming in and out all day on a piece of paper and you would draw and that's the one gift you would get for you know someone next year because other than that like what do you do but also lucky for me you also bring your mom and your dad a gift or your grandma and your grandma you know it's their house you bring them a gift and you also bring the kid who lives there a gift oh so So I had a pile you were showering yeah yeah Plus the youngest, you're always, you know, given the, I think you're indulged maybe a little I think more. so too. And, and you, you're, you know, I was like the only one there for a while. And then uh, when my grandpa passed away, I was in third grade. So it was just me and my grandma forever. God, that's wild. Mm-hmm. They really were older people. I oh, think yeah, for remarkable. sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What a great experience. Brooke, this is so much fun to have you come by. I want you to come by again. Maybe you can bring Steve Harvey with you next <laughs> hey, time. Let's see. Let's see if he's busy. <laughs> I'm sure did he's got you, a jet. He can fly did, over here. When you're doing Steve Harvey, <laughs> is they do it in L.A.? Where do they shoot? Yeah, in uh, Universal. Yeah. And does he uh, talk to you backstage or whatever? I mean, there's some he interaction. Was so nice. He came back and hugged us. And during the breaks, he's funny. He's chatting with everyone. Like, he looks and smells rich. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but he was really, really kind. There's just, it's like there's a glow around you when you're that successful. I saw him gambling on, <laughs> on roulette at the Bellagio Hotel. This is before he was doing every show on television. Okay, okay. And, and even then he, he, was w- he had rich, that right? glow. Yes. Yeah, because he had done original Kings of Comedy, which was really funny. You yeah, know, he's with, funny. With Cedric and all those. And he was very nice, although I, I could say clearly this guy is besieged by well-wishers. It must be really hard for him to go out and do anything, like just gamble at the Bellagio, because everybody wants to talk to him, everybody yeah. wants to shake his hand, everybody wants to tell him how great he is. And at some point it's you've difficult. Gotta, right, you've got to have some space. But he, he, he's really nice. I think that probably hurts too, is that you know he's kind of welcoming and like kind of, he kind of has like a, I don't know where he's from, he kind of has like a country vibe. Yeah, no, that's you know absolutely what I mean? right. And so he's welcoming and he's nice and he's funny. And that's also because so you're you on his show and you guys are attractive ladies. I would say, you know, you've, there's, we always hear these, you know, in the, that memo leak that, you know, Mr. Harvey doesn't want you to look at him in the eye as you are. I don't know how much of that oh, is true I or not. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. yeah. I don't but know I'm how much saying, of that is I'm true. I'm saying, yeah, neither do I. And I don't mean to, but I'm just saying, you know, you get the best of Steve Harvey. That is true. It's not, I don't know. I'll tell you who was really nice, who was coming up with Steve Harvey and he was in Kings of Comedy. And he really was 100% nice because I talked to him at length, I remember, on a flight, is Bernie Mac. I knew you were going to say it. Yeah. I knew you were going to say Bernie it. Bernie Mac I is one of the nicest people that. I've ever met. I I believe it. I yeah. believe it. Yeah. He seemed, oh, I know. That was what a, a real loss. Yeah. sad loss mm-hmm. when he died. Still with the original wife. Steve Harvey might also be. I don't know. But I'm He's just... married to a woman named Marjorie. She is like a, 
a bit of a fashion icon. And she, He's married. They've got a bunch of kids and grandkids. Yeah, well, that's yeah. great. I mean, look, it's terrific. I mean, he certainly does a great job on the 37 shows that he does. Right. Well, Brooke, I will want to encourage people to check you out on social media. Where can people find you? My handle is Brooke on air. You get it? Because, like, my name is Brooke. Yeah, I got but it. But no, it's Very Brooke good. with an E, too. Okay, and then that's the where you find Brooke both on Instagram and also on Twitter. Twitter. Mm-hmm. Right. And Twitter, you're more political, maybe. I think I'm, I'm more, you know, some or is of the it stuff on I respond to. Instagram is just pictures. That's me, too. I'm super political on Twitter, and then I'm way non-political on Instagram. I'm just like, this is just fun. I like to chat on Twitter. I think I like to talk about what everyone else is talking about. That makes sense. It's Brooke on air. Yes. Thanks for having me. No, it's really great to have you. Yeah. Brooke Thomas, everybody! <laughs> Sit down, sit down. <laughs> Hi, how are you? It's me, Arnold. I want to thank you for supporting Mark Thompson here on The Edge. Fantastic show with all the jokes and, you know, and all the commentary and the politics and the bullshit. I love it. You can listen to the show on iTunes or Stitcher, or you can just go to the damn website, edge-show.com. And now our featured guest, and I mean no disrespect to the other guests, a super scientist, oceanographer Jim Massa. Well, he's an oceanographer, a climate change researcher, a math professor. He's got his own YouTube channel. Jim Massa, all the way from Alaska, via the telephone. Welcome to The Edge. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Thank you for having me on your program. We're excited to have a, a scientist, and you're studying something that is just so of the moment. First of all, in Alaska right now, is it dark? Um, I'm in Fairbanks, so uh, outside Fairbanks. So the sun is above the horizon about five hours and ten minutes. We're at my current location. If you were to go to Barrow... I laugh because when you talk to a scientist, about five hours and ten minutes. I mean, you know, anybody else would say, it's about five hours. But you talk to a scientist, he goes, yeah, it's up about five hours and ten minutes. <laughs> if you were to go to Barrow, Barrow is still under 24 hours of darkness. The sun won't pop up until, oh, I think like uh, the end of this week or early next week, it'll pop up for 18 minutes, kind of go, hi, see you tomorrow. <laughs> you know, so it's like, Does it affect you psychologically? How do people deal with the fact that it's dark for, for so much of the day? Uh, seasonal affective disorder is a major problem here in Alaska, in all seriousness. That's why it's best if you suffer from such a thing to surround your place with full spectrum light bulb. It helps the pineal and the pituitary glands uh, secrete the, I think, a serotonin, melatonin, uh, whatever the appropriate hormones are to help deal with that. It is a problem up here. Do you have a life up there? In other words, I'm sorry, d- did you grow up there? Why are you there? Uh, I'm actually originally from the Northeast, the New Hampshire area. I-, I came here to go to grad school, something I always wanted to do. So, uh, and as an I oceanographer, I guess, an, as an expert in sea ice and so much related to those things around Alaska, I guess it's a pretty great place to be. Well, uh, technically, I'm a fisheries oceanographer, so I was looking at, you know, for my graduate work, I was looking at uh, advection effects on the food forage field of uh, salmon fry. You know, that's my the technical thing that I did. So lots of math and computation, whatever. But then I got involved with the, you know, institute here doing climate research. I got involved with sea ice folks. I know that you've been very much involved in permafrost studies and also these sea ice studies. I would ask you right away, what's the difference between permafrost and sea ice? Okay, well, sea ice is basically when the oceanic water freezes and forming the ice on the surface. In doing so, what happens is that this process called brine rejection, which means as the water freezes, the salt is kicked out of the and does not become part of the ice crystal. So theoretically, you could actually melt down sea ice and drink it. Wow. So all that ice is fresh water by definition. Basically, yes. By definition, it is. And what's interesting is when you get that what's called brine rejection, you can actually see film footage of this. You can actually see the, like, the little plumes of salty water sinking vertically because now you have this liquid water that has, that's full of uh, salt. It's at the surface. It's a little more dense than what's right below it. So it will start sinking. So, so sea ice is basically the, the, the sea water freezing to leave the ice surface. But now you have to also keep in mind that because of the salt content, the sea water will freeze at a lower temperature than does fresh water. 
was called freezing point depression. So that's why oftentimes you won't see sea ice forming until the water temperature is around minus two, minus three, minus four degrees Celsius. And we think of freezing temperature would be zero Celsius, I guess. That doesn't get it done with salt water. That is correct. The saltier the, the ocean is, the lower the temperature will be when it will start to form the surface ice. Now, to get to your question about what permafrost is, permafrost is uh, defined as frozen ground and technically permanently frozen ground. It is ground that has been frozen for at least two consecutive years. And it comes in all sorts of varieties. You can have what's called thaw stable and thaw unstable. Thaw stable is basically when you have a pile of rocks and pebbles, it freezes. And when it thaws out, you have a pile of rocks and pebbles. The thaw unstable, that's the, uh, the tricky stuff. That's basically frozen lurs, which is basically mud. It's silt. And when that thaws out, it just turns into this goo. I know a very technical term. And it, it does lead to what's called liquefaction. And this is where it gets tricky for buildings and roads and losing coastline. It can be messy. And so you're saying that's what these cold environments like Alaska and the like are exposed to because they've built on permafrost. That is correct. We uh, engineer our buildings and our roads here with the assumption that the ground is always going to be solid. And it's not. It's changing now. In fact, uh, most of the permafrost south of the Yukon River is within one degree Fahrenheit of completely thawing out. Wow. Wow. And that was thought of in, let's say, 1970 as sort of an unthinkable scenario. Yes. In fact, it's interesting you should pick the 1970s because that was a pretty cold decade here in Alaska. It was a the result of a rather strong La Nina signal throughout most of that decade. I was reading a piece about the 1970s state of Antarctica and ice loss from Antarctica since the 1970s has sextupled. In other words, they've lost so much ice, six times the normal amount. I just saw a recent study where they're estimating that 14,000 tons of ice is melting per second in Antarctica. It shows you how gargantuan this problem is and how things are moving at an extraordinary pace. That's true. In fact, what a lot of people don't realize is that in addition to the land ice on Antarctica, you have sea ice around the continent. The sea ice actually helps hold back the land ice. And now the sea ice is melting. And it, I just saw a recent study where there's far less of the sea ice. And now, basically, you have warmer oceanic water now reaching the land ice where it, it juts out just past the coastline. So it's now starting to melt the land ice from underneath in addition to warming from above. And now we're just having land glaciers just galloping into the ocean at this point. And if you look at the Thwaites Glacier and the Pine Island Glacier, those are two massive further inland glaciers of Antarctica. If those guys go into the ocean, we're looking at at least a 10-meter rise in sea levels worldwide, 33 feet. Jeez, think about that. So that just gobbles up a whole lot of coastline. And a whole lot of cities that goes with it. And the other thing is that this is a symptom of something that's happening, and that is catastrophic changes globally and more frequent droughts and severe storms and heat waves, more extreme weather. Exactly. And don't forget, we also have the issue with the Greenland ice. There was a uh, a section of ice off the northeast coast of Greenland that during 2018 completely melted twice. That has never, ever melted before. And here we have open uh, waters off northeast Greenland. It was just amazing to see that. And so there is stuff going on, and we have set some things in motion. Let's put it that way. Yeah. The sensitive ecosystems that exist around the world that are being thrown off, the migration patterns, the growing seasons, so many things related to these changes globally. I'm trying to build a worry list and also maybe a to-do list for humanity. Well, I discuss a lot of these things on my uh, on my program, but just for example, with the uh, warming, it's messing up the timing of, say, when birds build their nests, have their fledgings. They may mistime the insects. 
because the insects are now uh, pupating earlier and the birds arrive uh, later and they miss getting all the birds that can then feed their chicks. There's that issue. With me, I'm, I'm more of the uh, oceanic guy, so I can give you an example of what's going on in the Bering Sea. Yeah. And what was seen in the Bering Sea is we're seeing a change, and this is a dramatic change in the phytoplankton community. Now, phytoplankton are the producers in the uh, oceanic uh, system. They're, they're, they're your plants, in essence, and they're single-cell uh, organisms. Typically, we see diatoms. Diatoms are cold water phytoplankton. They are being, at least for sure, in the southern Bering uh, Sea, they're being replaced by coccolithophorids, which are phytoplanktons that like things a little warmer. This has drastic implications for the whole uh, food web, food chain ecosystem structure. It'll affect the zooplankton. It'll affect the fish to feed on the zooplankton, the fish to uh, feed on those fish, and so forth, all the way up to uh, seals, sea lions, orcas, you name it. Yeah, I, I guess I knew that some of those bigger mammals you mentioned, they do feed on that phytoplankton, but I never really knew there was a breakdown. And you're saying that, in essence, that cold plankton they can feed on, the warmer plankton they cannot, at least some of them. It, it changes the uh, community structure. So you might get different species of, say, zooplankton that dominate. And, you know, even though, say, the fish can eat the different zooplankton, it may not provide the nutritional requirements that the previous zooplankton that they grazed upon provided. And so if they're not getting nutritional requirements, their metabolic needs may not be met. And that could lead to a decreased physiological state. I want to ask you a question. I'll ask you the question, then I'm going to kind of give you my premise. Is this situation that is affecting us on Earth a runaway train that we are really too late to stop? Is it that we've done so much damage alongside damage that was done before our generation or the generation before us, before we realized what was going on, if you want to think of it that way? Have we done so much damage that these changes that we're talking about will be followed by other changes and then changes on top of them? And, and honestly, it's just a question of time. There's nothing we can do. And here's my premise in the background. If I knew the answer, if I was you and I knew that it was a runaway train, I still might not tell people it was a runaway train because one way or the other, we have to try to slow the train down. Well, have we done a lot of, set a lot of things in motion? Definitely. Is it a runaway train? The indications are that it is. The problem is twofold, as I see it. The first one is there is so much thermal inertia in this system that even if all emissions of greenhouse gases were to stop, this very instant, warming will still continue. Now explain what thermal uh, inertia is. Okay, well, uh, let's go back to general idea of inertia, which is uh, one of Newton's laws. Basically, a body at rest will stay at rest, or a body in motion will stay in motion unless another force acts upon it. You're saying the chain well, reaction has begun and will continue at this pace, even if you were to shut off all additional gases going into the environment. Exactly. Basically, with respect to heat you know, and energy. So yes, the energy system is in a, in a state of motion that it probably will persist. Now, I'm going to throw a little interesting caveat at you. I am one of those oceanographers who actually is of the opinion that global warming will eventually lead us into an ice age. Now, let me explain why I say that. There's a thing that goes on in the North Atlantic. It's in what we call the Gin Sea, Greenland, Icelandic, Norwegian Sea. It's basically the section of ocean where the Gulf Stream terminates. Uh, we call it the uh, Northwood Drift. The Gulf Stream carries warm, salty water from the tropics up to high latitudes. As it cools off, it gives off its heat, which is why the UK and Scandinavia have milder climates than they should for those latitudes. But as it gives off its heat, that water now becomes very, very cold. It's also very, very salty. Seawater density is determined by not only its temperature, but its salt content, what we call salinity. So now you have this cold, salty water. What does it do? It sinks. It sinks down vertically. We call this the Atlantic Meridional Overturn Circulation. And 
this basically starts with you you may have heard of the conveyor belt it's a big deep water oceanic flow throughout the whole planet that's a heat distribution mechanism for the entire planet well we're melting so much water fresh water is being added to the surface of the ocean think of the uh the ice melting from greenland so that what happens is now that you have this cold water, but it's not as salty, it's not as dense, it doesn't sink as readily. Oh. And we, there is precedent for this. If you look at like the Little Ice Age and other periods where the Earth was cooler, there is evidence that there was a freshwater input into the North Atlantic and the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturned Circulation, slowed down or shut down, and hence no more heat transfer mechanism. We're seeing already a slowdown in this deep water sinking, this deep water formation. And by the way, when that water sinks, it sinks down to about 1,000, 1,500 meters or so and returns southward in the Atlantic. It's called the North Atlantic deep water. Eventually, it will upwell, that means rise to the surface in the Southern Ocean, you know, not too far from Antarctica. As it does so, it brings up lots of nutrients. The phytoplankton go to town. The Southern Ocean, in the region what's called the Antarctic Divergence, is the most productive open water region of all the oceans. If the AMOC shuts down, the conveyor belt shuts down, you lose that upwelling, you lose that productivity for the Southern Ocean. So what happens to the Southern Ocean? It becomes a dead zone? In essence, over time, the productivity will drop off, and yes, that will happen. Now, that what kind of time frame does all of this stuff happen in? I mean, for example, we've talked about things that are happening in weeks, months, and years now. I mean, things are literally in five years and dramatic changes. I mean, cataclysmic changes. But what sounds to me like what you're talking about is more of a geological time kind of change, which is slower by implication. Well, we used to think it would take centuries. The recent uh, analyses indicate it could happen on a scale of decades. So you're saying you could so, you could really be looking at an ice age? I mean, at a at things getting colder in that time? It, the possibility is that within decades we could start seeing a cooling down. Does that mean we're going to have immediate glaciation and and ice sheets growing in the northern hemisphere? Probably not. But this again ties back into the question of the thermal inertia. Is there enough thermal inertia to one offset? or to uh, delay the possibility of the AMOX and the conveyor belt shutting down. That is a question that we just don't have answers to. I've got to let you go here in a minute, but I want to ask you something that I feel almost stupid having to ask, but the idea of what's happening here, and we sort of alluded to these various changes in, in the globe, many of these things, it would seem, correspond to the industrial age, you know, the man-made pollutants that are being discharged into the environment and the changes that it's having on that environment. And then as you began to talk about the ice age, I thought, well, some might interpret that as you see, the planet's going through natural changes one way and now it's going through natural changes the other way. But that's not what you're saying. I'm asking, but let me finish my question. It doesn't seem like that is what you're saying. What you're saying is the things that we've done post-industrial revolution in terms of raising the temperature of the planet so dramatically because of what we've done have set a process in motion now that will then lead to this chain reaction. But it's not as though the Earth was just going to go through that on its own. Well, what you have to see, the really key important concept that everyone needs to bear in mind is the rate of change. Simply put, the rate of change is the fastest we see in the Earth's history. Now, you think about it, and since the industrial, start of the Industrial Revolution, that's about, what, 170 years or so, something like that, we've basically increased the planet's temperature by 1.3 degrees Celsius. We've increased the levels of CO2 from 280 to 417. We have not seen rates of changes that fast ever. We just don't. So it's the rate of change that's really just causing all this problem. And because it's so happening so fast, organisms are not able to adapt. And so that's leading to the extinction of many of these organisms. We're in the middle of a, a Elizabeth Colbert wrote a superb book on, called The Sixth Extinction. And yeah, we're right in the middle of it. <laughs> and to be clear, I'm asking, you know, this is a human caused event. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. There is no doubt about that. In fact, through a technique called isotopic fractionation, we can identify where every single molecule of CO2 came from in the atmosphere. We can tell you if that is a biological source or the result of burning fossil fuels. We can tell you that. So when people say, well, you guys don't know what you're doing or you're just making stuff up, goes, no, we have the techniques and the data to back up everything we say and do. That's what we do as, as scientists. You know, like from my own experience here in Alaska, I can tell you that the sea ice extension, it doesn't extend as far south as it used to. It doesn't get as thick as it used to. The, uh, the amount of multi-year ice is dwindling rapidly. You don't get three, four, five-year-old sea ice anymore. You get one or two. That's it. Here's another thing to think about as to why the Arctic is warming the fastest. With less sea ice, that's more open water. That means instead of the sunlight energy being reflected back into space from hitting ice, the water absorbs that energy and heats up, hence making Alaska much warmer and surrounding polar regions. Alaska has warmed like four degrees Celsius over the last 40 years. Wow. I mean, it's just, a, it, it's just, when you think about specific heat, which is the amount of heat required to raise a certain given volume of a degree Celsius, the specific heat of water is far higher than air. So to heat up the given volume of water one degree C and the same volume as air one degree C, it takes considerably more energy to heat up the water than it does the air. So when the oceans are warming up, just think of how much energy that equates to. It's it's mind staggering. When you look at the the Anthropocene extinction, you talk about the sixth extinction, this sort of thing. We're talking about something. Make no mistake about it. We're talking about the extinction of ourselves. The fate of all species is extinction. But yeah, we're we're definitely doing ourselves in if we don't uh, change course. Uh, you know, well, the oceans alone, I would think as an oceanographer, you must be sensitive to the fact that as we continue to kill the oceans, which is what we're doing globally, and please, these are just things I'm positing, knock them down if they're not right, but with larger and larger parts of the ocean that are absent of life and that as we continue to just treat the ocean as sort of an open sewer, we kill more of it. Anyway, guess what I'm getting at is we kill enough of the ocean and then we're done. Oh, yes. When you consider that nearly half of the world's population lives within... 100, 150 miles of coastline. How many people rely on their food source from the ocean? We have overfishing. We have, don't forget, ocean acidification. The CO2 mixes with the water, forms carbonic acid. That, you know, it might be a, a quote unquote weak acid. It still lowers the pH and that kills the coral. It also causes the shells of animals to dissolve. Decreased pH means uh, you increase precipitation. So now the animal shells start dissolving or out or from around them. And then you have all these other situations with, with the stratification and the heating of the water. Yeah, we are still in the ocean. And don't forget, you know, where's that? The uh, Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It's a pile of garbage about the size of France out in the middle of the Pacific. It's stunning to me, and I try to find a route to optimism, and I struggle because it doesn't seem as though there's any policy being pursued that gets you to a better place, you know? I wish we could say that we're just driving blindly off the cliff. I feel like we've got our eyes open, and we're still driving off the cliff. Well, you know, as scientists, we present our findings. We present our interpretations. People may excoriate us, what have you, but we're doing the best we can. We make our recommendations. Unfortunately, we don't set policies, and uh, you know that thing is part of the problem. You know, we we do what we can, you know, to get the information, disseminate the information to the general public. Well, it's great to talk to you, Jim. I'd love to continue to touch base with you occasionally. Oceanographer, climate change researcher, math professor, environmentalist—you just bring so many different disciplines to this conversation. And I appreciate you sharing some of your research with us today. Go to YouTube, and it's Science Talk with Jim Massa, M A S S A, and Jim Massa. How how cool to talk to you. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me on, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Hope we'll talk soon. I look forward to that. Stay in touch, thanks, Jim. Thanks again, Mark. Okay, my friend. Well, I hope you enjoyed our show, Conversation with Jim Massa. I hope it didn't get too detailed. It does sound like we could maybe make some differences to slow down the process of Earth's warming and uh, changes to the planet. Thanks to Michael Shore, thanks to Brooke, and thanks to Jim and finally, you for being here. Until next time, bye-bye. This is Donald J. Trump, dictator of the United States. Mark Thompson is a huge loser. 
His show, very bad, soft. But if you're interested in crap and you're a communist, you can go to edge-show.com.